old man's back hair and bark in his ear. The old gentleman complained mildly about these familiarities at last, and when he got through with his statement, he said that such a dog as that was not a proper animal to admit to bed with tired men because he was so <laughs> veritricious in his movements and so organic in his emotions. We turned the dog out. It was a hard, wearing, toilsome journey, but it had its bright side, for after each day was done and our wolfish hunger appeared appeased with a hot supper of fried bacon, bread, molasses, and black coffee, the pipe smoking, song singing, and yarn spinning around the evening campfire and the still solitudes of the desert was a happy, carefree sort of recreation that seemed the very summit and culmination of earthly luxury. It is a kind of life that has a potent charm for all men, whether city or country bred. We are descended from desert lounging Arabs and countless ages of growth toward perfect civilization have failed to root out of us the nomadic instinct. We all confess to a gratified thrill at the thought of camping out. Once we made 25 miles in a day, and once we made 40 miles through the great American desert, and 10 miles beyond, 50 in all, in 23 hours without halting to eat, drink, or rest, to stretch out and go to sleep, even on stony and frozen ground, after pushing a wagon and two horses 50 miles is a delight too su so supreme that for the moment it almost seems cheap at the price. We camped two days in the neighborhood of the sink of the Humboldt. We tried to use the, sp the strong alkaline water of the sink, but it would not answer. It was like drinking lye and not weak lye either. It left a taste in the mouth bitter in every way execrable and a burning in the stomach that was very uncomfortable. We put molasses in it, but that helped it very little. We added a pickle, yet the alkali was the prominent taste, and so it was unfit for drinking. The coffee we made of this water was the meanest compound man has yet invented. It was really viler to the taste than the unameliorated un un water itself. Mr. Ballou, being the architect and builder of the beverage, felt constrained to endorse and uphold it, and so drank half a cup by little sips, making shift to praise it faintly the while but finally threw out the remainder and said, frankly, it was too technical for him. But presently we found a spring of fresh water, convenient, and then, with nothing to mar our enjoyment and no stragglers to interrupt it, we entered into our rest. Chapter 28 Arrive at the mountains, building our cabin my first prospecting tour, my first gold mine, pockets filled with treasures, flittering the news to my companions, the bubble pricked, all not gold that glitters. After leaving the sink, we traveled along the Humboldt River a little way. People accustomed to the monster mile-wide Mississippi grow accustomed to associating the term river with a high degree of watery grandeur. Consequently, such people feel rather disappointed when they stand on the shores of the Humboldt or the Carson and find that a river in Nevada is a sickly rivulet, which is just the counterpart of the Erie Canal in all respects, save that the canal is twice as long and four times as deep. One of the pleasantest and most invigorating exercises one can contrive is to run and jump across the Humboldt River till he is overheated and then drink it dry. On the 15th day, we completed our march of 200 miles and entered Unionville, Humboldt County, in the midst of a driving snowstorm. Unionville consisted of 11 cabins and a liberty pole. Six of the cabins were strung along one side of a deep canyon, and the other five faced them. The rest of the landscape was made up of bleak mountain walls that rose so high into the sky from both sides of the canyon that the village was left, as it were, far down in the bottom of the crevice. It was always daylight on the mountaintops a long time before the darkness lifted and revealed Unionville. We built a small rude cabin in the side of the crevice and roofed it with canvas, leaving a corner open to serve as a chimney, through which the cattle used to tumble occasionally at night and mash our furniture and interrupt our sleep. 
It was very cold weather and fuel was scarce. Indians brought brush and bushes several miles on their backs, and when we could catch a laden Indian it was well, and when we could not, which was the rule, not the exception, we shivered and bore it. I confess without shame that I expected to find masses of silver lying all about the ground. I expected to see it glittering in the sun on the mountain summits. I said nothing about this, for some instinct told me that I might possibly have an exaggerated idea about it, and so if I betrayed my thought, I might bring derision, derision upon myself. Yet I was as perfectly satisfied in my own mind as I could be of anything that I was going to gather up in a day or two, or at furthest a week or two, silver enough to make me satisfactorily wealthy. And so my fancy was already busy with plans for spending this money. The first opportunity that offered, I sauntered carelessly away from the cabin, keeping an eye on the other boys, and stopping and contemplating the sky when they seemed to be observing me, but as soon as the coast was manifestly clear, I fled away as guiltily as a thief might have done, and never halted till I was far beyond sight and call. Then I began my search with a feverish excitement that was brimful of expectation, almost of certainty. I crawled about the ground, seizing and examining bits of stone, blowing the dust from them or rubbing them on my clothes, and then peering at them with anxious hope. Presently I found a bright fr fragment, and my heart bounded. I hid behind a boulder and polished it, and scrutinized it with a nervous eagerness and a delight that was more pronounced than absolute certainty itself could have afforded. The more I examined the fragment, the more I was convinced that I had found the door to fortune. I marked the spot and carried away my specimen. Up and down the rugged mountainside I searched with always increasing interest and always augmenting gratitude that I had come to Humboldt and come in time. Of all the experiences of my life, this secret search among the hidden treasures of Silverland was the nearest to unmarred ecstasy. It was a delirious revel. By and by, in the bed of a shallow rivulet, I found a deposit of shiny yellow scales and my breath almost forsook me, a gold mine, and in my simplicity I had been content with vulgar silver. I was so excited that I half believed my overwrought imagination was deceiving me. Then a fear came upon me that people might be observing me and would guess my secret. Moved by this thought, I made a circuit of the place and ascended a knoll to re reconnoiter solitude. No creature was near. Then I returned to my mind, fortifying myself against possible disappointment. But my fears were groundless. The shining scales were there, still there. I sat about scooping them out, and for an hour I toiled down the windings of the stream and robbed its bed. But at last the descending sun warned me to give up the quest, and I turned homeward, laden with wealth. As I walked along, I could not help smiling at the thought of my being so excited over my fragment of silver when a nobler metal was almost under my nose. In this little time, the former had so fallen in my estimation that once or twice I was at, on the point of throwing it away. The boys were as hungry as usual, but I could eat nothing. Neither could I talk. <coughs> I was full of dreams and far away. Their conversation interrupted the flow of my fancy somewhat and it annoyed me a little too. I despised the sordid and commonplace things they talked about. But as they proceeded, it began to amuse me. It grew to be rare fun to hear them planning their poor little economies and sighing over possible privations and distresses when a gold mine, all our own, lay within sight of the cabin, and I could point it out at any moment. Smothered hilarity began to oppress me. Presently, I was hard to resist. It was hard to resist the impulse to burst out with exultation and reveal everything, but I did resist. I said within myself that I would filter the great news through my lips calmly and be serene as a summer morning while I watched its effect in their faces. I said, Where have you all been? Prospecting. What did you find? Nothing. Nothing? What do you think of the country? Can't tell yet, said Mr. Ballou, who was an old gold miner and had likewise had considerable experience among the silver mines. Well, haven't you formed any sort of opinion? Yes, a sort of a one. It's fair enough here, maybe, but overrated. Several thousand dollar ledges are scarce. 
though. That Shiva may be rich enough, but we don't own it. And besides, the rock is so full of base metals that all the science in the world can't work it. We'll not starve here, but we'll not get rich, I'm afraid. So you think the prospect is pretty poor? No name for it. Well, we'd better go back, hadn't we? Oh, not yet. Of course not. We'll try it a rifle first. Suppose now, this is merely a supposition, you know, suppose you could find a ledge that would yield, say, $150 a ton. Would that satisfy you? Try us once from the whole party. Or suppose, merely a supposition, of course, suppose you were to find a ledge that would yield $2,000 a ton. Would that satisfy you? Here, what do you mean? What are you coming at? Is there some mystery behind all this? Never mind, I'm not saying anything. You know perfectly well there are no rich mines here. Of course you do, because you have been around and examined for yourselves. Anybody would know that, that had been around. But just for the sake of argument, suppose, in a kind of general way, suppose some person were to tell you that $2,000 ledges were simply contemptible. Contemptible, understand? And that right yonder, inside of this very cabin, there were piles of pure gold and pure silver, oceans of it, enough to make you all rich in 24 hours. Come. I should say he was as crazy as a loon, said old Baloo, but wild with excitement, nevertheless. Gentlemen, said I, I don't say anything. I haven't been around, you know, and of course don't know anything. But all I ask of you is to cast your eye on that, for instance, and tell me what you think of it. And I tossed my treasure before them. There was an eager scramble for it and a closing of hands together over it under the candlelight. And old Baloo said, Think of it. I think it is nothing but a lot of granite rubbish and nasty glittering mica that isn't worth ten cents an acre. So vanished my dream. So melted my wealth away. So toppled my airy castle to the earth and left me stricken and forlorn. Moralizing, I observed then that all that glitters is not gold. Mr. Ballou said I could go further than that and lay, it upon, and lay it up among my treasures of knowledge that nothing that glitters is gold. So I learned then, once for all, that gold in its native state is but dull, unornamental stuff, and that only low-born metals excite the admiration of the ignorant with an ostentatious glitter. However, like the rest of the world, I still go on underrating men of gold and glorifying men of mica. Commonplace human nature cannot rise above that. Uh, 